Welcome to the Kresge Auditorium. If you will please take your seats, we will be starting momentarily. We request that you make sure all cell phones and pagers are turned off. And also please note that all audio and video recording is prohibited. Please limit any flash photography to just the first one minute of the presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome MIT President Charles Vest. Thank you. I want to welcome everyone to today's discussion and presentation by uh, Microsoft's Bill Gates. I think one of the first things you'll observe that is in the old days, the academic used to come out in a sweater to introduce the corporate leader in the pinstripe suit. Today we're going to reverse that role, and I don't think that will surprise anyone. Uh, and then again, Bill is not your typical CEO. In fact, he is not a CEO. As you may know, he is the chief software architect of Microsoft. And he is indeed here today to discuss with you some of the grand challenges facing computer science as we move into the future. Bill's been a good friend of MIT in many different ways for many years. Starting next September, many of you are going to be studying and meeting and eating in the Gates Building in the new Ray and Marie Estata Center. Many of you already are the recipients of the work that has been done here at MIT under our iCampus program done and carried out in collaboration with Microsoft Research that has really reinvigorated and reinvented much of teaching and learning on the MIT campus. But I also want to say in particular that Bill Gates has been a great enthusiast for MIT's Open Courseware Initiative, something many of us believe very deeply in because it is a way of taking the knowledge and the pedagogy that is generated here at MIT and making it accessible to people in other institutions all around the nation and throughout the world. Bill is here today to talk, as I said, about the great challenges facing the future of computer science. But before he comes out, I want to say something quite personally. In addition to the work that we're all here to hear about today in computer science and information technology, Bill and Melinda Gates have done something extraordinarily wonderful for our planet in the work that they are sponsoring to improve health and to eradicate disease throughout the developing world and improve the lives of people who live under conditions that none of us in this room can even imagine. So please join me in welcoming Bill Gates. Well, it's great to be here at MIT. MIT has invented so many things and played such a key role in the advance of computer science. Uh, I won't have time to name them all, but uh, Microsoft has been pr very privileged to be associated with MIT and, and helping uh, uh, collaborate on a number of uh, projects here. Uh, Microsoft is also uh, has some great employees uh, who came from MIT, uh, most notably uh, people like Gordon Bell, uh, who's doing some, uh, uh, still very creative after uh, making so many contributions, and also uh, Butler Lampson, who's actually back here teaching courses, uh, as well as continuing to, to help Microsoft. The main thing I want to present today is how I see the next 10 years of computer science as doing some really amazing things, uh, solving some problems that have been out there for many decades, and transforming uh, most things of interest, uh, transforming the way people work in businesses, the way they deal with information and meet and communicate, uh, transforming uh, the way that people at home find information, uh, the way that they uh, create things and connect up with other people, 
uh, and transform even the sciences, uh, bringing the methodologies of mach machine learning and modeling and rich data mining into all of the hard sciences and allowing those uh, sciences to move to the next level. It's a paradox to me uh, that computer science today is poised to do all these amazing things, and yet in some ways, people's expectation and uh, even the excitement level about computer science is not as high today as it was, say, uh, five years ago uh, when we were in the midst of uh, what we can now look back and say was the internet bubble. Uh, many of the challenges, the problems, uh, the, the things that were hard to deliver on during that period are exactly the kind of things that a combination of great academic work and great uh, commercial work coming together has solved uh, and will make sure that the productivity advances that we see in the economy will be dramatically higher, more than double uh, what we received in the 1990s. Uh, and that's very profound uh, for innovation, employment, uh, many things on a, on a global basis. The computer his industry uh, started by making very big, expensive machines. And in fact, when I was young, uh, people thought of computers as kind of these uh, daunting things in the back room that would often print out bills that would be wrong and you could never get corrected. Uh, people talked about taking the punch card in your billing envelope and, and uh, putting staples in it or mutilating it to somehow defeat the big machine. And I was lucky enough uh, uh, to, to be uh, young at a time when that changed. Uh, my friend Paul Allen uh, saw the very first microprocessor, the 8008, uh, not very capable. Uh, but better than a PDP-8 was, uh, and he, he challenged me, he said, hey, Bill, could you write software for this? Could you do a basic? Uh, and that really got us going, saying that we wanted to be on, on the ground floor of uh, building the kind of software that computing would need as it moved from that back room onto the desktop, as it became a tool of empowerment, a tool for creativity and communications. Now, it started in a very humble way. The kit computer that uh, uh, Paul saw on the cover of Popular Electronics magazine, a freezing cold day uh, in Harvard Square, uh, and brought back to me and said, you know, you got to drop out. Uh, it's happening without us. Uh, uh, that machine uh, was laughable. Uh, you know, it at most had 8K of memory, uh, had no peripherals, so the software we, we wrote would flash lights and do funny things. It was a major discovery that because of the noisiness of the electronics in it, that we could actually uh, put a radio nearby and, and uh, if we did certain instruction patterns, cause predictable music to come out of that radio. Uh, and it was you know, kind of uh, limited what we could do. But that was the beginning. And the kind of excitement around that, thinking you know, where could this go, uh, that, uh, that got our industry off to a great start. There was a generation of machines that came after that, so-called 8-bit machines, TRS-80, Commodore 64, uh, Apple II, all of which included Microsoft Basic in as their uh, fundamental software. It was uh, the equivalent of not only the language, but the operating system, everything. And you could type in uh, basic statements to do graphics and games and business software. And we even got disks connected up to these things. We moved away from cassette tapes and paper tapes to these ridiculous eight-inch uh, disks uh, that you know, hardly held any information at all, uh, but constant improvement. A big milestone in 1981 uh, was the entry of IBM with the PC into this business, and that had been a joint project with Microsoft uh, where we'd convinced them to use the 8086, uh, created the DOS operating system, very limited system, uh, but very appropriate for that machine, uh, and we kicked off an era uh, that was, was fairly different because starting with that machine, we had a vision that we wanted all the machines to be compatible. That is to use a software layer to make it th so that whenever you wrote an application, it would run on machines from IBM or HP or digital equipment or any of the other computers of the time. And that hadn't been the case. And in fact, that prevented the virtuous cycle that we wanted to have happen. It prevented it from getting going. And that cycle was that as more people saw applications that were meaningful to them, uh, they would buy machines. The more machines that were bought, the more volume of components would happen, the lower the cost those components would be, and the more people would invest 
in buying uh, applications so it would make sense to really build a software industry. There essentially was no software industry before the PC. Uh, there were about 20 different companies, and the highest award in the industry uh, was one that you got for selling 1,000 copies of a piece of software. It was called the ICP Award. And I filled out the application after we'd sold 2 million copies of BASIC. Uh, I sent it in, and they said, well, we'd love to give you this award, but you know, there must be some scientific notation error here. Uh, you've got too many zeros. And I said, no, I'm not kidding. Uh, we sold two, 2 million copies. And they said, well, geez, how come we haven't heard of you? And we said, well, I don't know where you've been, but uh, we, do, we do have this uh, very high volume, low price model. So you know, we're not like on the New York Stock Exchange or anything, but we have sold uh, 2 million copies. And so personal computing gained a momentum. It gained an excitement. Uh, the, uh, one of the great uh, issues was the move from character mode interface to graphics interface. It may seem strange today. You know, everyone takes that for granted. But the uh, cycles required, the difficulty of writing these programs, made a lot of people say, hey, we don't need this. That's just frilly, you know, too many icons, too many fonts. You know, let's stick to the serious stuff. We love these monospace characters up there on the screen. And there were about six or seven years where taking some of the pioneering work from Xerox, uh, Apple and Microsoft really pushed forward with this idea of graphics interface. And that became Microsoft Windows. It was integrated in the operating system. Uh, and then, then we got to the next frontier. Uh, that frontier was connecting all the machines together. And year after year, we'd always say, email's coming, connectivity's coming, online services are coming. And in fact, it didn't happen and didn't happen. And then all of a sudden, uh, coming out of the university environment, uh, the standards of the internet exploded, uh, along with the decrease in, in the cost of optic fiber and uh, the increase of the speed of the network. And a critical mass was achieved. And that was the period where you know, things definitely went a little crazy. Uh, but the gold rush atmosphere actually accelerated the investment people were making and raised the awareness. Uh, that people had of what a revolution this was. Now, some of the things that are hard uh, about e-commerce or workflow or modeling or uh, making sure these systems are ultra-reliable, uh, ultra-secure, uh, some of those were revealed as, as shortcomings that needed software breakthroughs, needed uh, software advances. And so as we look forward, uh, it's kind of a bias I have, uh, but the thing that's really going to make a difference is software. Uh, it, it is a uh, new generations of software that let us interact in natural ways, that connect these devices up in new ways, uh, and problems that I see being solved uh, in, the, in the near future. Now, the hardware guys, uh, I have to give them credit. They've always provided a more powerful platform for us uh, to exercise our software creativity against. And that's why uh, Paul Allen and I could say back in 1975, personal computers will be mainstream. Uh, the, the slogan we had was a computer on every desk and in every home. And in you know, some small part, uh, in some countries, we've come a long ways towards that. It's not yet the machine that we envisaged in terms of the ease of use or breadth of things that can be done, but it's certainly a, a good rough draft that's, that's on its way. The hardware people have given us uh, Moore's Law that predicts uh, doubling in chip performance every 18 to 24 months. Uh, that's held true uh, these last 25 years. And you know, some, something like the next 10 to 15 years, it's very likely to, to continue to hold true. Uh, now, that increase in transistors, there are some very interesting software techniques uh, re related to parallelization that are needed to take transistor count and map it into performance. It's not automatic that just because you have twice as many transistors that you get that performance. And so, you know, finally, some of these issues of, of automatic parallelization and understanding the algorithms that let you do that, uh, we're making uh, progress on those. The storage people do an even better job than the chip people. Their, their doubling rate is something like 12 to 18 months. And this is very important, because when storage was expensive, the idea that you could deal with photos and videos and audio annotation and replicate information around so it would be immediately available, even if the uh, system's not connected up to the network. You know, that just wasn't possible. Uh, people didn't think in those terms. And in fact, you know, storage is so available now, we have to be creative in thinking about 
uh, what, what we're going to do with it. Uh, we're getting uh, lots uh, and lots of that. In fact, a good example of how cheap storage is is that we have this uh, device that comes out this fall called the Portable Media Center. Uh, it's a 40 gig disk, uh, beautiful LCD display, and you can uh, just connect this to a PC uh, that's recording TV shows or has your movies or you know, whatever's there, and uh, it automatically downloads uh, the movies, videos, photos onto this device that you can, of course, carry around and, and use any way you, anywhere you want. And these devices will come out uh, fairly inexpensive uh, in the $400 range, and the price will just come down and down and down because uh, you know, this is the magic of, of that hardware innovation. Eventually, we'll just take it for granted uh, that kids who want to watch movies or people who want to watch shows have this available. And so it won't just be portable music players, uh, but devices that, that deal with the, um, the video as well. The screen is another place where innovation is critical for us. You know, if we think about how we can move reading from paper to the screen so that we get the rich searching, updating, annotating, uh, sharing that the digital world allows, uh, that requires screens with very high resolution. It requires screens that we're comfortable you know, holding in our lap and just sitting there paging through the information. It requires a thin light device, long battery life, big challenges. Uh, but certainly what's gone on uh, with LCDs and other screen technology says that in the future we can assume you know, a 30-inch LCD on a, a knowledge worker's desktop or three 22-inch displays, which is the configuration I'm using uh, right now and you know, lets me work with information in a much better way. In the same way that a newspaper gives you a big wide field of vision, uh, this uh, does that. And there's certainly some advances in window management and use of the screen area that has to take place as we get to extremely high DPI and big screen uh, areas that, that come with this. And we believe that reading will move uh, onto the, the digital platform, that the superiority, the cost structure, all these things argue for that as we get devices uh, that uh, are, are, are based on this new screen technology. A, a nice milestone in that is, is the arrival of the tablet PC. Uh, that got kicked off about a year ago. It's based on the miniaturization hardware, the ink uh, software, ink recognition technology that we've been working on for over 10 years. Uh, is now bootstrapping in terms of the quality of the hardware, learning from that software, doing that better and better, and, and making that mainstream. And so you know, all the portable devices will become uh, tablet devices, and they really will be like tablets, which they're a little bit heavier than a uh, tablet today. Uh, the graphics processors uh, there, the improvements are, uh, you can get higher transistor counts there because of the number of uh, duplicated components. And uh, actually, if we look to the future of CPU architecture, we can see that more predicted by what's happening in the G GPU level because they've thought about uh, parallelization. Now, they do it in a domain-specific way that we need to open up, but it's really the blending of those uh, that is the, uh, the next uh, stage there. A big element, of course, is wireless. Uh, as we get things like ultra-wideband wireless, which is hundreds of uh, megabits, the idea that you connect a computer to the screen will become obsolete. The computer will find the screen that's nearby and take advantage of it. The idea that the computer and the storage have to be associated with each other, there's no reason for that. Uh, you can carry your storage with you and whatever PC is around in a very secure way. Your storage can be made available to it. Uh, and you can be given guarantees that that information isn't left on that machine uh, after you log out from that machine. So we'll see the disaggregation of the PC that way. Uh, we'll see the arrival of rich new peripherals. You know, digital cameras are now uh, the most popular way to take photos, and that's happening in the motion video space. Well, those devices will have ultra-wideband, um, so they'll mark not only the time but the location of that information and deliver that uh, to your storage system. Your storage system will be a combination of data stored in the cloud uh, in sort of a far site, uh, ocean store type way where you don't have to worry about whether uh, you've backed it up because there's many copies uh, but that are stored in encrypted ways that, that mean that only you have control of that information. Or you'll have the storage that you carry with you physically that'll give you uh, total control over it. Making those two things work well together is very important. Now in the area of wireless, 
one of the tough challenges has been the cost of broadband. You know, what, when you think about what's expensive, you know, getting a PC, say, into rural India, you know, the hardware is three or four hundred dollars, uh, the software is less than uh, fifty dollars. It's that broadband cost, the monthly cost of paying again and again and getting that infrastructure out there that's really the prohibitive factor. And uh, we believe through some software techniques around mesh uh, uh, networks and uh, some advances in the wireless hardware, particularly the uh, WiMAX type approaches, uh, bringing in not just omnidirectional approaches but directional antennas as well, that we will get the kind of connectivity that can make sure uh, that you know, connecting everyone on the planet becomes very feasible. So you'll have a, a range of devices, uh, wall size screen devices, uh, desktop, tablet, uh, pocket size. Uh, we even believe in a, a wrist size uh, device. In fact, I'm wearing my spot watch, uh, which just came out in the last month. Uh, and and this, I don't know if, if you've seen it, it lets you, you know, see sports uh, activities, stock prices, your schedule, you get messages on it, uh, a lot of different things that are being transmitted to this watch. It was actually when I was at MIT over 10 years ago that I first saw a demonstration of FM sideband uh, data networking. And this watch is, is based on uh, that approach. Of course, the modulation techniques are uh, several generations later. There's a microprocessor in here that we paid National Semiconductor to create that's based on the ARM uh, architecture. This microprocessor, just on my wrist, has 10 times the power of the original IBM PC. Uh, it's got 10 times the memory of the original IBM PC. Now, this thing is powerful. Uh, and, of course, the battery life uh, it's on the order of, of, of many, many days because uh, these things are low power. We can download arbitrary programs to this device. So as we get new ideas about sports presentation, information presentation, as people have neat things they want to do, it can come down in an automatic way. Uh, today, the, the watch is in receive-only mode, but we actually have the capability to send data as well uh, in a local area. And so you can you know, find people of common interest, a lot of applications that the glanceable information uh, platform will uh, be particularly appropriate for working with the other devices. Now we have to think in terms of scenarios, the photo scenario that you use all the different devices, the uh, scheduling scenario using all those devices. And it's way too hard today uh, to get those things to work together. One of the big places that software advances will change, thing is, change things in the way, is the way business is done. The information visibility that a typical information worker has is extremely low. Uh, they're used to it in a way, so they don't know to complain. But their ability, you know, say somebody gives them a sales printout, they look at these numbers and they, you know, they must think, wow, that one's really big. Wow, what did we do? Now, that one's kind of small. Geez, are we in trouble? Well, their ability to just dive into that data and see it by time period, product, cost structure, they don't have it. It's not there. The, the schematization and model approach to bring that down to every employee to just naturally expect that they can see those things and understand those things, that's not there. You know, the world of business intelligence uh, hasn't delivered on that. The XML foundation that's advanced so fantastically over these last six years is the foundation to make that happen, to build XML into the spreadsheet, uh, to build a knowledge of business processes so you can visually see What's the state of this activity? Businesses today do all these custom modifications to the applications programs they run, the, the enterprise applications. And it's very strange because the differences between those businesses, you ought to be able to express it in some other way, other way than code. You know, code is complex. Uh, when people update the applications, you don't know how to combine that new code with the other code because it's not orthogonal. You know, there shouldn't be code in that process. There should just be visual business processes that you're connecting up to and explaining how this business is different than this business. You know, how does the order process work? How does the collection process work? How does the analysis process work? And that's the kind of thing we're really on the verge of uh, because XML gets our semantic level up and lets us finally address uh, making this information really available. If we look at meetings, meetings are a source of a lot of inefficiency 
any information worker will, will tell you. You know, things that they didn't need to be there for, things they, meetings they had to fly into that they would have preferred to be able to do at a distance, things that didn't get followed up on, things that somebody who wasn't there you wanted to explain to them that uh, you couldn't just link in and see the transcript or see the video of what, what went on there. Well, storage is almost free, and cameras and software to scan and understand this stuff will be almost free. And so we can take the meeting and have that be something that we bring a lot of efficiency to. You know, if you, if you make meetings in general 10% more efficient, that's uh, tens of billions of dollars of extra productivity every year. Uh, and that can be used just as cost savings, it can be used to make better decisions, to drive quality into processes, and, and it will do every one of those things. Even the basic process of buying and selling uh, hasn't uh, been, been made as efficient as it should be. Can you find all the sellers of a particular type of product? Can you check their reputation? Can you, if you engage in a transaction, see the state of that transaction in a very rich way? If your computer's talking to their computer, uh, and their computer is somehow malicious, are you protected uh, from that kind of behavior? If the software's talking to the other software, what about the workers? Uh, you know, say that there's a delivery that's defective. How do you coordinate the negotiation on email in an ad hoc way with these back-end systems so they can understand things and check the state of things. Uh, these things are incredibly inefficient today, so basic workflow is not built in. E-commerce has not happened. E-commerce only really happens where every seller can find every buyer, every buyer can find every seller, uh, independent of location or previous uh, knowledge of each other, and that rich transaction uh, is done in a, a pure digital way. In communications, you know, what we've got today is kind of a hodgepodge of different things. You know, the latest thing is blogging. Uh, that comes after instant messaging, which comes after email. You've got your wireless phone, your wired phone. Uh, lots of times you're interrupted. The phone rings when you don't want it. Things come into your inbox you don't want. Uh, and your time is a scarce resource. And so these activities are wasting your time, uh, causing a, a lack of productivity. Even in some cases, you have enough spam that you filter out or don't have time to read mail that would have been of value. Um, now for me, spam, uh, you know, it's this awful thing, uh, but sometimes when I look at the spams I get, I have to just step back and, and laugh about them. Uh, I've got a few examples here. Uh, this is one of my first ones. Uh, uh, and it's clear once I get out of debt, I'm gonna be meeting a lot of nice people. Uh, <laughs> We're going to be friendly to me. Uh, the next one looked like it might be more targeted. Uh, and uh, this is not one that any of you need uh, worry about, uh, since I hope you, you won't uh, drop out. And finally, there was one that really related to a serious cost problem I've got. Uh, and that, uh, you know, the shareholders really want me to dig into this one. Uh, understand what's going on there. Uh, so it's, you know, it's a serious problem, but uh, it's amazing the things that are out there. Letting people send billions of pieces of mail uh, very, very cheaply, you know, devalues the time of the person on the other end. And this is a very solvable problem. Uh, we need mail that uh, comes from people we communicate with regularly to be authenticatable, and we announce on Tuesday a way of doing that, uh, leveraging off the DNS that uh, uh, we think can be applied and uh, used as a standard literally uh, within months. Uh, mail that comes in from a stranger, uh, some type of proof uh, is necessary. If the filter thinks that looks like spam, then you need some type of proof to distinguish it uh, from the other email. And uh, there's several uh, forms of proof that will be used, and they all work in parallel. Any, any one of them is kind of an or condition. Uh, proof that's computational, uh, where you solve one of these problems that's asymmetric in the opposite way that cryptographic functions are. That is, it's asymmetric in the sense that uh, checking the answer is easy, but actually doing the computation is hard. And so for somebody sending a modest amount of mail, it, it'll just happen in background, they won't notice it. But if you were sending millions of emails, uh, it would be a significant computation cost to do that, so you, you screen out. 
uh, human interactive proof where you bounce back and make somebody solve something that uh, software alone can't do is, is another approach. Or if there's a connection into a payment system, making somebody put a little bit of money at risk, uh, not that gets charged to them, and this is only email from strangers, but that is at risk so that if it really is junk, the person who re receives it and spends time reading it, at least they get the benefit that whatever the threshold they set for their time, their inbox uh, rate, uh, that gets uh, credited uh, to them. But if it's their long lost brother or somebody saying their house is on fire, uh, hopefully they won't debit uh, that. They'll say, okay, uh, that was just at risk and I, I'm glad that person connected up to me. In the home environment, when we think about media and memories, uh, there's so much that can be done. And yet, we're going to have to deal with a lot of volume. You know, all the music you like, all the movies that you're interested in, all those photos that you take. Uh, it's kind of amazing. We have a researcher at, at Microsoft Research who wears, as, as they go around in the day, uh, something that's just a camera, and it notices when there's a big scene change or when there's people laughing or anything loud or something, and it takes photos. Uh, and so at the end of the day, that researcher has over 100 photos that might be interesting to put in, in uh, her journal and, and save and even annotate with some voice or something. Uh, but you know, software's got to help select which one of those things are interesting and to, to navigate amongst those things. And, and so there's uh, a lot that has to be done on that. We want to put users in control in the home. You know, this idea of watching TV shows only on a schedule, slowly but surely that's going away. You know, people use that whether it's built into what we call the media center PC or a TiVo or the, the satellite receiver, get very addicted to it. It's kind of like email where you know it's not perfect, but you don't want to give it up. Uh, you just want it to get better. And so as we think about that, uh, we think about you know, what kind of interfaces uh, would, would uh, deliver on that. And in fact, I've got just real quickly a couple prototypes from Microsoft Research I wanted to uh, to give you just a sense of this. In fact, these were both done by uh, uh, an MIT graduate. It's, the first one here is uh, pretty straightforward. Let's say you're looking at movies. You're looking at Blade Runner here. Uh, and what it shows is, OK, the director is Ridley Scott. Well, then I can go over here and see other movies directed by Ridley Scott. And I can just select one of those, uh, Alien. Uh, that's brought to the center. And of course, then all the things related to that come out. And I can see, OK, these actors. and see the different things they were in and see if you know, one of those might be interesting, and just pivot through these uh, sets of movies in a, a simple visual way. Of course, this will be annotated with the reviews that you trust, comments from friends, uh, you know, if you've seen the movie, what you thought about it. And so very navigable to get around uh, the, the movies of interest. The other one I wanted to show uh, has to do with photos. And photos we're dealing with uh, you know, lots and lots of photos, literally you know, if you take your lifetime, uh, uh, tens of thousands of photos that you and your friends are sharing, and you, you'd like to be able to get back to in a rich way. And so here we see them as miniatures. I can just, you know, hover over these things, lots of photos. We've even mixed in uh, video clips as well. Uh, here's, you know, Gordon Bell at the Computer Museum. Uh, because we don't think the boundary between stills and motion will hold up. In fact, you know, these audio comments that we call photo stories bring a lot more emotional connection uh, to that experience. And so, when, you know, it's just like this. Uh, you know, it's hard to find exactly what you want. And so people will take these things with keywords. Uh, here's things that relate to Thanksgiving. We can do software analysis. And so if we're, you know, we want the photos with faces, we just select those. If we want the photos that are indoors, the software can select those. Uh, if we want the outdoor photos, we can select those. Uh, if we want to see photos that are similar, uh, you know, let's select this bridge photo and say, OK, you know, what I can relax the constraint and say, what's similar to that? OK, that's a lot like it. That's a little bit more like it. And I can select groups of things uh, to be used. Uh, this software automatically, when it brought the photos in, uh, helped uh, orient the photo by being able to recognize uh, the cases where things were kind of, uh, at least to the software, looked like they might be misoriented. Uh, we can also start to use a 3D uh, way of looking at these things, to group these things. And what that means, I, you know, now this is by timeline, so I can select a set and take these. I can change the uh, timeline, get to finer groups uh, in terms of when they were taken or where they were taken. 
And this makes it very easy to just step through these, but also uh, deal with groups that I want to uh, organize and tag in different ways. So in a general sense, we can say, well, that's just a database. Uh, but we need much better ways of interacting with the database than just the common query processor. You know, people won't be writing SQL statements to uh, navigate through their photos. Now, this optimism I have about computer science and its impact, uh, a little bit the, the proof uh, of how serious we are about that is the R&D spending uh, that has been increasing uh, at Microsoft. Today, it's 6.8 billion a year. Uh, it's kind of an intimidating number, at least to me, uh, since uh, 10 years from now, people will say to me whether that was wise or, or not. Uh, but I, you know, I'm quite confident that it is. That's the largest uh, technology R&D budget that there is. Uh, IBM's about 20% uh, less than that, but of course, not all focused on software. And then other commercial entities, you'd have a big drop down, particularly if you take the long-term component, the, the Microsoft, uh, the equivalent of Microsoft Research. We actually do our research work in three different locations, in Cambridge, uh, and in our headquarters, and in Beijing. We have smaller groups on some other areas, but those are the, the primary uh, areas. We've had, a, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a strong collaboration on a number of things with MIT. Uh, for example, the iCampus project, we're a key partner in that. You know, I, I'm you know, thrilled at the things that are coming out of that. Some uh, involve the uh, learning at a distance, some involve the tablet PC. Uh, you know, the idea that we can make learning better, there's no doubt, and I think that's a, a great pioneering project. Uh, natural interfaces uh, for learning, that's this magic uh, paper idea, that's uh, uh, a fantastic thing. You know, we've gotten involved in things that think, uh, uh, we've got a lot of uh, people on the faculty here that are helping drive our agenda. For example, Victor Zhu's on the technical advisory board for our group uh, over in Beijing. So it's been a good, uh, uh, strong relationship. And the progress being made in the combination of academia and commercial research labs is really uh, fascinating. It's, it's phenomenal, and, it, and it's not getting that much visibility. And, and yet, these advances are extremely relevant to problems uh, that, that we have, the problems that are, are of critical importance. Uh, take, for example, security. Uh, of course, uh, MIT is a, a strong programmer on that. Uh, of course, you've got uh, Professor Rebest, who uh, just got the, the Turing Award, which is a fantastic thing. Uh, security is something that, if we're going to achieve the potential, these, these systems has to get a lot better. Uh, and that's a tough thing, because code reliability gets into that. Uh, how you configure up these systems, how you watch behavior is part of that. So it's going to take some breakthroughs. Uh, over 25 years ago, uh, when I uh, was leaving Harvard, this idea of proving program correctness was sort of in vogue. And unfortunately, for many years, although there was some progress, the scale of the program it could be applied against uh, didn't get very large, hundreds of lines of code. Uh, now, uh, working with universities, uh, people in Microsoft Research are taking literally things that are a million lines of code and being able to go in and prove very important things about those programs. Or if they can't prove them, they're able to show the counterexample that says, yes, this can touch memory that it shouldn't touch, or it can uh, uh, acquire the lock and never release the lock. And so you see exactly what the pattern is and how to fix that. Now, all this proving technology is having a wonderful effect on innovation in programming languages, because we want to take everything that the programmer knows about the data types and the constraints and express those in as high a level, a strong a fashion as we can through contracts. And this idea of expressing the contracts very easily, uh, having uh, languages that are very explicit about those things, you know, that takes all the theory of language innovation and, and brings it into the mainstream you know, and says we really need uh, those, those capabilities. Uh, keeping systems up to date, uh, being able to look at a system and say, is its behavior normal? We need this both at the, at the single computer level and looking at the network. Is there a type of traffic that's exploded in terms of usage at a time where the overall traffic is starting to be uh, too heavy for the network to deal with? There should be automatic tools out there that are doing that. And in fact, mach machine learning techniques that build a model of typical behavior and then uh, see these things that are unusual be, will be used at every level of the system. 
uh, at the memory management level, at the API level, at the network uh, sending level, and at the, the wide network monitoring level. And that, we call that behavior blocking, and that, that'll be a critical component in uh, solving those security issues. Another set of areas that uh, I think are making wonderful progress are getting a more natural interface between users and the computer. Uh, you know, Victor Zhu here has been a, a big advocate of that, building some wonderful systems that take speech all the way up into particular domains and let people interact with those. And making it so that it's a, not a huge technical exercise to build uh, one of those systems that you just have a, a general runtime for that, I think is something that will be solved uh, in the years ahead. The progress in speech recognition is very good. Uh, if you take a isolated, a simplistic case where there's no context uh, and no noise and a perfect microphone, uh, three great simplifications, the difference between a human and a computer is not very drastic. Um, it's as we relax those constraints and bring in context, uh, crummy microphones, and noise that then the divergence between the computer uh, and, the, and the human is quite substantial. Uh, and of course, human users of these things are very demanding. Because speech doesn't operate at a conscious level, uh, as it makes mistakes, you just get irritated and talk louder. And of course, it's been trained, it's learned you're speaking in normal tone, so it just gets worse and worse. And so it just degenerates while you're yelling at the system. Uh, now, ink is not quite the same. Uh, it's a little easier because you process ink at a conscious level. And so although it's irritating when it doesn't work, you can look and say, well, hmm, could I have recognized that? You know, is that E looped so closely that it looks like a C? And in fact, uh, as we monitor people using our handwriting system, the plasticity is partly in our subsystem, but it's, a lot of it's in the user, that the user consciously or subconsciously is actually writing uh, more explicitly the features that have caused the, the problem in the past. So that's one where, uh, that's partly why ink is coming into the mainstream, uh, say, a few years in terms of general input, uh, the equivalent of dictation a little bit faster. The place we're seeing our speech work really catch on is a combination of people where the keyboard is uh, unattractive for them uh, for any reason, including repetitive stress injury, or people in uh, China, Japan, or Korea, where the keyboard is relatively less effective as an input technique. We can al already beat the fastest typist of Chinese with a uh, Chinese speech recognition system. And so, you know, that's a milestone uh, along the way that uh, is pretty exciting. Uh, general artificial intelligence, uh, this is the holy grail. And when I was talking to the faculty today, I was impressed that MIT has kept its commitment to this area uh, you know, throughout all the years. And, and it is one where uh, some very interesting approaches, statistical approaches, Bayesian approaches, are now starting to be used in different, fa in different fashions. The actual product on the market uh, that it, apparently is a, a spin-off uh, related to a professor here is this, the thing that goes around and vacuums the rug. Uh, and that's pretty low level, uh, better than nothing. Uh, but we, you know, we want to move up in terms of uh, the things that go on. Uh, for gaming, one place we're using our, our machine le learning technology a lot is we, on Xbox Live, can watch player behavior and different strategies, and the machine can learn. And so if you want to pick an opponent, uh, typically, the, if you play the computer historically, it's a, it's a road algorithm that you know, isn't that much fun to play because it, it eventually you uh, see that as, as being very predictable. We can take all the play styles that we're seeing across uh, this network and create any sort of level of difficulty or different fashion of play and you know, make it as, as interesting and as varied as playing with human opponents, including uh, letting you win every once in a while. Uh, uh, which it, for, on video games, for me, that is pretty tough. You, know, you pick these things up and they are geared to, uh, well, to, to you. Uh, and not to uh, uh, people who haven't, haven't used them nearly as much. And so we'll make these things appeal. And even if you start to beat the system, boy, we'll crank it up uh, to a level that will, uh, that will keep it challenging. So AI is going to be applied in a lot of different ways. Uh, modeling uh, things in the other sciences, uh, happening with dynamic behavior in systems, uh, very, very important. Uh, all the natural interface techniques, vision, speech, 
uh, will come to take those for granted uh, in a very strong way. Now, the boundary between computer science and the other sciences historically was a fairly hard boundary, and that is breaking down. Uh, one great example of that is a research we have, Jim Gray, who looked at astronomy and said, boy, there's a lot of data there, and a lot of the advances come in, in proposing something that you can either validate by looking at that data or, or invalidate. And so we really need to get all these databases connected together. And the, the semantics in our very uh, high level, it's again not just a relational problem, but uh, collaborating with a lot of astronomers who know the domain, he's been hooking up those databases and now navigating through this logical, logically connected database uh, is a very important tool in astronomy. Uh, and many of the sciences are going to where those, those data, rich data collections are necessary for everyone to have access to in a high level way. Uh, biology, of course, is perhaps one of the most challenging because of the breadth and the differences in the data. But even there, uh, this is starting to happen, and you know, I had a, a great discussion with some of the faculty who were pushing off in that direction and really seeing the, that the boundary of computer science and biology are uh, very much coming together, uh, and we need people who understand both of those things to make advances in uh, uh, solving diseases. Uh, and I'm very optimistic about uh, how fast that will move forward. Now, this tool that we've got, uh, the PC connected to the internet, you know, all this great empowerment, it's such an important thing that uh, we do have to worry that there are people who are benefiting from this and people who are not. And, and people talk about that as the digital divide. It's something that I think people in computer science uh, should care a lot about and, and uh, in various ways contribute to trying to minimize uh, that difference. Uh, one of the, the projects that uh, Microsoft got involved with, uh, together with my foundation, was saying, well, what about libraries? Uh, would it be appropriate to have computers there? And we were a little worried about this because, you know, would the librarian like it? You know, would it be at the expense of the books? Would kids come in and just hack up the machines? Uh, would, uh, uh, would they be doing enriching things uh, as they were using those computers? It was, it was unclear, but six years ago, we kicked it off. We did pilot projects. And over six years, in all 50 states, in 18,000 libraries, uh, you know, rural, uh, everywhere in the country, we put in over 50,000 computers. And the response of the librarians was just phenomenal of wanting to be trained, wanting to reinforce the, the, uh, the role of that library. And traffic to the library increased, not just to come use the, the computer, but also the number of books uh, that were being lent out. And we were able to monitor and support all these things in a very efficient way uh, that uh, made it work very well. You know, throughout the project, we learned things. You know, we came up with a version of the software you can just hit a button to switch from Spanish to English uh, for a lot of these libraries. We had a button you can just hit to switch to big print. Uh, so if you don't like reading the fonts uh, that we typically use, boom, all of a sudden, uh, it's a lot, a lot better. You know, we came up with things to help people with the common scenarios. And so, uh, you know, it's great to see if you give people those tools, they'll use them. Uh, and they, it really makes a big difference for them. Uh, getting these tools out to schools, getting them out to all different countries, a lot of challenges remain there that uh, need, need to be addressed. If we think about computer science, one thing computer science has done uh, through the internet, through software, has made the world a smaller place. In fact, you know, people now worry that this is going to create a new level of global competition. And the answer is it is. Uh, people's opportunity to have great jobs in the future will be far more determined by their level of education uh, than by what country they happen to be in. Historically, it didn't matter, if, uh, your education level didn't matter that much. If, if you were in a rich country, you, you made a lot of money, and if you were in a poor country, you made very little money. Now the opportunity uh, for educated people worldwide to help out, to contribute to products, uh, not just software products, but anything you can imagine, architecture, law, answering the phone, you know, it, it will be done uh, where people have those skills. And as people look at that, they go, wow, what, what does that mean? Well, it means the U.S. has to keep its edge in terms of doing the best work. And that means research, it means intellectual property, it means uh, improving the education system, you know, rededication. It's very similar to what happened in the 1980s when there was a lot of angst about Japan. Uh, Japan at the time appeared to 
have a model where they would just pick an industry, the car industry, the computer industry, the consumer electronics industry, and boom, they would, they would do it better. And the great thing that happened in the 80s is there was a lot of humility, a lot of thinking, well, do we just match what they do uh, exactly that way, or do we just push forward on our strengths, our approach to things? You know, during the 80s, they did this uh, AI project, uh, uh, and, and it really, because of the way it was done, it wasn't done with the diverse academic approach that we use here, it, it really ended up in not generating much. Uh, so we rededicate ourselves, and it's actually the work done during that period that led to that productivity uh, increase that, that benefited all countries, but the U.S. in particular, during the 1990s. You know, I, say that, I see that same thing repeating itself as we question our unique role uh, and reinforce uh, what needs to be done. One challenge that we have uh, in the field, uh, in all science fields, uh, but particularly in computer science, is the issue of diversity. You know, to do the best work, we want to draw on uh, everybody's talent and give everybody a, a, a deep involvement. You know, the variety of jobs, the need, uh, the need for great people is, is pretty phenomenal. And the diversity numbers in some professions, like law and medicine, uh, have, have been going uh, pretty strongly in, in the favorable direction. Uh, one thing I've personally gotten involved with uh, to try and help push this forward is a scholarship program uh, that's called the, the Gates Millennium Scholarship. Uh, and here at MIT, out of, out of actually 1,000 people uh, who get those scholarships, 60 people are here at MIT. So uh, it's a, a great thing and a real uh, endorsement of MIT that there are more Gates uh, scholars at this school uh, than at any other school. You know, these science problems are tough, uh, but they're fun to work on. Uh, the jobs that are involved with them are, you know, you can have an impact, you can work, work with other people. It's not just somebody isolated off uh, coding all night, although if you want to do that, uh, that's fine. We still have lots of jobs that are like that. And so the, uh, uh, the, the sense of reward of uh, being involved in changing business, changing entertainment, changing education, you know, giving tools to those new science, sciences, including uh, to help with disease. I think that's a phenomenal opportunity. And so that's why uh, I'm more excited about computer science than ever, and I'm very excited to see uh, what some of you uh, here can do uh, taking that to the next level. Thank you. Do me a favor, have your question end with a question mark. <laughs> so it should actually be a question, and try and keep it as uh, short as you can. And then when you're done, go take your seat and give Bill a, a chance to answer it. You're up. Um, could you explain to me .NET? I've, I've seen a lot, a lot of things about .NET. Never really understood what it does, what it, you know, it actually accomplishes. Well, the, there's a revolution in. Uh, how information is represented around XML. And that's something that we and a few small companies got behind now seven or eight years ago. And in the year 2000, we said we were really betting our company on taking those XML representations and having some protocols around them that have, uh, are now called the web services protocols, making those standards, standards that would exist on any operating system, any language, and letting those be the basis for deep interoperability, uh, for applications like e-commerce uh, that I, I talked about. And so .NET is us embracing XML, embracing web services, and building that into the Windows platform. And it means building web services and XML into Excel, building it into the SQL Server database, having Windows use that to be the way that you set it up and manage it uh, so that management isn't a, a set of protocols or approaches or APIs that are separate or off to the side. So bringing .NET to all of our products uh, and connecting it up this way is, is something that's a, a very broad project that we're about 60% of the way done with. Uh, 
And when we made that bet, it looked like a very risky bet. But I have to say, at this point, with the cooperation on the web services standards, the excitement around XML, uh, it's not, not a bet that's risky at all at this point. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. Um, if you were 19 years old again, and let's say this time around today you're at MIT, and Microsoft was already founded, would you continue your education or, and or create like a new company and what type of company and why? Well, I, I loved going to school. Uh, it was... <laughs> he didn't go to yeah. MIT. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, you know, it was very similar. There were very smart people around to talk to every day. Uh, they fed you every day. Uh, <laughs> You, know, you didn't have to go to classes. Uh, if you worked a little bit, they'd give you this positive reinforcement, these grades every once in a while uh, to encourage you. And so what had happened was my friend, Paul Allen, who saw this microprocessor and really uh, egged me on, had come out to Boston and taken a job out here at Honeywell to say to me every day, it's time to start our company. It's time to start a company. Well. Uh, he didn't succeed until he had that cover of Popular Electronics and said, it's going gonna, it's gonna to start without us. Uh, let's be the first. And so then, officially, I didn't leave school. Uh, I went on leave. Uh, no, I'm still on leave. Uh, <laughs> uh, in fact, when Harvard has my name in their publications, they always put 77 after it as though, uh, you know, as though I graduated, which, of course, I, I didn't. And so I'd say that. You know, if I was a student today, I'd certainly be uh, you know, looking for some paradigm shift that could make a, a dramatic change. Uh, I don't know if I'd work in AI, computation bi computational biology. Those are two that you know, I really love, and I'm glad to hear those are, there's a strong increase in emphasis in, in those things uh, here at MIT. But I'd say that anyone who has in mind you know, a deep paradigm shift for an industry, uh, go ahead, you know, take the risk. Go away for a couple of years, and you know MIT will probably let you come back if uh, it wasn't the paradigm uh, uh, shifting thing that you'd, you'd hoped it would be. Thank you. Thank you. Many people consider you an inspiration. Who is your personal hero? <laughs> <laughs> I have many heroes, people that I've I've been uh, lucky enough uh, to work with. You know, from my parents to uh, a lot of the people at Microsoft. One that I'd really highlight uh, is Warren Buffett. Uh, his way of you know, looking at the world, looking at how business should be done, uh, showing that you can have fun while doing a, a very important uh, tough job. Uh, he's had an incredible influence on me. And you know, it's part of the reason I say, hey, I have the best job in the world, because I can, I've had a chance to meet somebody like Warren and, and get his advice. And, uh, his humor, uh, which is, is really, really unique. Please. Hi. Um, how do you feel about software patents and their role in either promoting or uh, stifling innovation? And are you concerned about them long term? I know that Microsoft got sued like a little while ago for the IA browser really? plugin. Oh, we got sued. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's interesting because we're on, on really both sides of this patent thing. Uh, we, because of our success, are a target uh, for patents, some of them not uh, as good as they should be. And we're also a company that files lots and lots of patents. We file more software patents than any other company. The patent system is not perfect. And I think you know, uh, any freshman could look at the patent system and suggest improvements to the patent system. But, uh, it's a system that has worked amazingly well, you know, despite its mistakes and its problems. Over several hundred years, you know, starting with Benjamin Franklin, uh, the kind of incentives for invention, you know, the creation of the biotechnology field, is that a good thing? The pharmaceutical industry, is that a good thing? These are industries that the US leads in and that have created immense improvement in human welfare, and all based on just taking the patent system as it was and using it uh, so that as they would do innovative work, there would be some, uh, some incentive there. And so you know, I think we, we absolutely can improve the patent system, but it, it's something that is important. And particularly, if we look at global competition, the things that 
you know, generate jobs here, or help the U.S. be a, a strong leader, a lot of that is that if we're super innovative, there's uh, a, a reward that goes with it. Right, thanks. Uh, so there's an, a really interesting trend that I think you started to touch on, but you didn't dive very fully into, which is the commoditization of software and software innovation. And what I was wondering was, how do you see Microsoft kind of fitting into a world where you know, software is cheap and produced at very low cost? And what do you have to say to your current and prospective fleet of software engineers? Current? Current and uh, prospective fleet of software engineers. Oh, great. Well, the, yes, uh, software has this interesting property uh, that, unfortunately, it never wears out. And so when we sell somebody a copy of Windows and Office, uh, they can just use it you know, forever. And they don't owe us a dime. It's theirs. They get to use it. And so all we get paid ever, uh, it's not like Coke where they get thirsty again. Uh, that, that's a good business. Uh, <laughs> but it's not as fun to be in, in a business like that. Uh, all we get paid for is our breakthroughs. We have to come up with a version of Office that's worth licensing, worth installing, worth learning, worth dealing with some uh, you know, effect it might have or it, it might you know, change things. And that's our economic proposition versus all the free software that's out there, all the installed base of our best work of the years past that's out there and people aren't, don't have to pay us a thing for, we have to innovate enough that it's worthwhile to license. Now, there's another way to look at it, though, which is if you take a knowledge worker, uh, most anywhere, uh, even in Bangalore and Hyderabad, uh, you know, they're making you know, $40,000 a year. They've got an office. They've got phone bills. They've even got paper clips. Uh, what we're saying to people is, hey, pay us less than $100 a year uh, for the right of that person to have the very best software, the very best software to communicate, create, collaborate, organize their thing. So as a percentage of what it costs you to have that information worker, to have the very up-to-date, the very best software, is it worth uh, something less than a, you know, $100 a year to do that? And you know, that's, that's the, when, when we hire people, we say, hey, if you don't think we can do that, you shouldn't join, because that's what the standard we're held to uh, every year. And so far, uh, we've done OK. Uh, and certainly the customers, when I meet with customers, I've never been in a meeting where they say, you're done, you're done. Uh, you know, they say, hey, your stuff isn't easy enough to administer. It's not secure enough. It doesn't do this feature. It doesn't let us do this customization that we need. So the need for better software and the impact of better software uh, is, is super, super high. And the fact that we've created this high volume, low cost model you know, works very well. The fact that once we solve workflow, there's hundreds of millions of people who will benefit from that. Once we get the spreadsheet up to this modeling level, hundreds of millions of people who will benefit from that. It's a model that you know, has worked and, and that I believe in. Um. You gave us a broad overview of many different aspects of um, where you see things going in the future. I wanted to focus on the digital divide. Um, where, how did you, or are there are a lot of people with, with money that don't do nearly as much as you do. I'm, I'm wondering why you found that very important, if there was a specific experience, and what's your concrete vision for Microsoft and for your foundation for bridging that divide between you know, the US and other countries around the world, developing countries? Well, Microsoft, it, it, its philanthropy focuses really in, in two areas. One is that whatever causes our employees believe in, we match their donations. So if they want to give to MIT, uh, you know, they want to give to some local uh, uh, church, whatever nonprofit, uh, we match that, including they can take company software and provide that at extremely low cost. The other thing is, the other focus is digital divide. And this means going to every country and thinking about how can we get computers to be available. Uh, it means the Boys and Girls Club thing we've done in the US, the library thing we've done in the US. Uh, there's a group called Empower that provides software to nonprofits and lets them uh, do those things. So for Microsoft, it's very much digital divide. My foundation is a little, little bit different. And, and for Microsoft, why do we do it? Well, 
uh, our employees love it. You know, it speaks to our mission of empowerment, that it's not just empowerment uh, for uh, people who are wealthy, it's empowerment, empowerment for everyone. So it's a great morale thing. They get deeply involved, and, and, it, and it builds relationships uh, with governments and other people we want to work with. For me personally, uh, the focus is a little broader uh, because I didn't want uh, my philanthropy to be just you know, related to that one thing. And I thought I wouldn't do philanthropy until I was old. Uh, I thought, okay, I'm going to work and make money, and then I'll stop doing that, and then I'll give money away. Uh, and I knew I was going to give it away because I don't believe that passing uh, substantial sums of money to your children is necessarily good for them. Uh, they may not agree. Uh, uh, in fact, there's one story about that where uh, I was in bed uh, this weekend at 7 in the morning, and my daughter comes in and wakes me up and says, Dad, Dad, I was using the computer. You've got to come. I said, come on, just keep using the computer. It's OK. Uh, no, you've got to come. I, I won some money. Uh, and so we went, and of course it was one of those uh, contests, you know, that she really hadn't won any money, they wanted her to visit the website, and uh, you know, it made me think, geez, you've got to get rid of that stuff. But, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I've chosen that my resources are going to go back to society in, in the, the best way that I can come up with. And that's turned out to really be two things. One is uh, world health, that's the biggest thing, that's in my view the most urgent problem in the world at large very unaddressed, I could speak for days about that. Uh, and then second is the biggest problem in this country, which is education. And that's where the library program and the Gates Millennium Scholarship Program comes out of that. And because of the urgency of those two problems, I've ended up doing something I didn't expect to do, which is, uh, you know, I'll have some days where part of the day I'm trying to make money, and then part of the day I'm, I'm giving it away. And So far it hasn't made me schizophrenic to try and uh, <laughs> bridge those two, two modes. Yeah. Um, I had a question relating to security. I guess it's a great responsibility and a big challenge, too. Um, my question is most centered on, a, I guess, a recent paper by um, Dr. Gear about um, the monoculture of Windows. Like, you guys are so popular that, you know, basically, if there's a security problem, it, a lot of people have it. Um, first, do you think that that is a problem? And second, um, what kind of solutions do you guys think should be applied to that? Well, it, um, it is not. Uh, and if you say, OK, you're, there's, there's two types of security things that go on. There's people who want fame. And uh, they like to attack the most popular system. And as we get down the learning curve of making it so they don't succeed, that actually deals with the most serious security threat. The serious security threat is not somebody who's who just wants fame. It's somebody who really wants to steal information. And so as we beat the, the fame-oriented IQ, uh, drive that regularity down, we actually create, we'll create the first system that's truly secure, that is tested by lots and lots of IQ and come up with uh, much richer methodologies uh, that allow that to work. And so, you know, there's breakthrough ideas that come out of research in universities that are allowing us to get to that extremely secure point. It's a process of, of a number of years looking forward. The approach where you say, hey, let's have, you know, how many operating systems do you want? 50, 100? Uh, that just says to a company, hey, your salary data's on 100 different operating systems. And applications, people have to try and write software for 100 different operating systems. Oops. Now, you can't buy the same applications. That would be a monoculture. You've got to buy 100 different word processors. Uh, and everybody has to learn those, but they don't exchange data. But what's the security statement? All you need is one bug in one of the 100 operating systems, or one of the 100 word processors, and your, your salary data is out to the world. Variety, just say V equals variety, V increases the, the uh, threat area. It may slow down. Uh, the idea of these spreading functions that are done for fame, but it doesn't make information any more secure. So what does the world need? The world needs a small number of operating systems uh, that, are, uh, that have firewalling techniques and isolation techniques and verification techniques that makes them secure. And in a sense, we're on the fastest learning curve moving to that 
Uh, it's the most urgent thing we're doing, and it's, you know, of our R&D, that's several billion a year just focused on that challenge. And so, you know, variety is not the answer. Uh, uh, technology and uh, the investments we're making are what, what drive towards that answer. I'm sorry to say we have time for only one more question, so please make it one that Bill Gates has never heard before. <laughs> well, that's... <laughs> wow, that's uh, pretty tough. Um, I guess this is a finance question. Um, Microsoft currently has around $50 billion in um, cash equivalents or uh, short-term securities, a number that's going to reach about $100 billion in a few years. What do you see Microsoft doing with that money? Or how do you justify holding that much cash? Uh, <laughs> I sleep well at night. Uh, <laughs> no, it, it, your, your question is actually a very serious question, and one that uh, we have. The interesting thing about software is it's not really based on building a lot of factories or you know, buying a lot of materials. And going back to the early days of Microsoft, Microsoft uh, has been profitable. You know, we never had an, an internet business model. It's ironic that we actually took the company public at all because we never, that money is still sitting in our bank account. We never spent a dime of that money. It was really just to get the incentive system for the employees, which uh, you know, net has been more generous than any incentive system that any company uh, has ever done. And so I, you know, it, that was a, a good thing in that dimension, but it wasn't to raise capital. And so we've accumulated capital. Uh, we've done buybacks over the years. I think we've spent, you know, what, 30 billion on buybacks over the years. Uh, we've instituted a dividend uh, that was modest at first, then we doubled it. It's still fairly modest. And as we're moving forward, we do need to continually evaluate uh, this. We've tried to manage the investments and the money very well, but there'll come a point where we either through buyback or dividend or uh, you know, whatever other approach might exist, we probably will uh, change the balance sheet of, of the company and make it more pure. Because what we're all about is one thing, developing software. And you know, we want, when people buy our stock or think about our company, you know, that should be it. It shouldn't be about how we invest uh, our treasury uh, thing or you know, anything else, just about uh, are we, is there that opportunity in software and are we, we the company seizing it? Thank you. thank you, and thank you for your questions. Well, Bill, thank you very much, and of course, you can't leave MIT without your very own MIT sweatshirt. That's great. And, and we know that probably every university gives you a sweatshirt, but we're the only one that's also going to give you a hard hat. And on the front is a picture of the William H. Gates building taken a few minutes ago. We're Great. Good help. Thank you. That's super. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.